Um, so I think that we'll make a start here. Um, I just want to start by saying thank you all very much for, for joining us for what we hope is going to be a very interesting um, discussion um, on the relationship between biodiversity and nature and migration. Um, we've got a really excellent panel and an excellent moderator here. So, um, you know, thanks again for joining. Um, I'm going to make a quick start with some technical issues before I, I hand over to Celine for moderation. Um, the first thing is just to let everyone know that we are recording this event, um, so please be aware of that, and that will be shared after the event, um, and it will be distributed further. Um, the second is that we'll be doing live tweeting during the event, so please feel free to um, join the conversation on Twitter. We're using the hashtag uh, EU Green Week 2020, and we're, we're tagging um, IOM at EU for this event. Um, also, uh, towards the end of the event, we'll be uh, um, uh, doing a Q&A segment. So at that stage, you can put questions um, uh, to the panelists um, and to the moderator in the chat function. Please, when you do that, we would really appreciate it if you could uh, uh, have your name, your full name and your institutional affiliation there. Um, or your role, um, so everyone knows um, what that where, what that direction is. Um, and that's it on the technical side. So now I'm just going to hand over to um, Professor Salimul Hook. Um, we're very uh, very um, honoured to have Professor Hook on moderating this session. Um, Professor Hook is the director of the International Centre for Climate Change and Development um, in the Independent University of Bangladesh, and has been since 2009. Um, he's the senior fellow in the Institute, International Institute for Environment and Development in London, and of course he's um, worked extensively in issues to do with climate change and development in general. So thank you, Salim, and over to you. Thank you very much, Katie, and good afternoon and good morning to everybody to this, uh, uh, I hope, will be a very interesting uh, discussion on the search for greener pastures exploring the relationship between nature, biodiversity, and migration. Uh, my name is Salim al -Haq, as you heard. Uh, please call me Salim. Uh, it's my pleasure to be the moderator uh, for this, uh, uh, the next hour and a bit that we are going to be together. Uh, I'm going to start by just laying out the three major objectives of this uh, uh, exercise or this webinar or meeting, uh, and then I will briefly introduce the uh, the five uh, discussants that we have, uh, and then I'll ask each of them in turn uh, to give a little bit of a, a longer uh, uh, background uh, briefing of themselves, and then we'll go into the conversation and the questions. So the three major objectives that we have uh, for this uh, session is firstly to raise awareness of the relationship between nature, biodiversity, and migration, drawing on practical examples from different biogeographical regions both in Europe and outside Europe. We have uh, Northern Norway and, and uh, Senegal uh, represented here for that. Uh, the second is to highlight the importance of policy coherence to address these issues, which often are siloed in different uh, places and are not uh, linked together, and to discuss how these could be reflected in the European Union green policy, in the European Union financing, and including in the European Union's biodiversity strategy for 2030 going forwards, and obviously also in the forthcoming COP climate negotiations that will take place later next year. And thirdly and finally, we want to unpack the roles and responsibilities of different actors, including the European Union, governments, the private sector, regional bodies, uh, to ensure that migration is considered in the rollout of the European Green Deal. Uh, very often it is left out and is taken as a, a problem that occurs after the event because it hasn't been taken into account in the earlier stages of planning uh, of the event. So uh, these are the overall three areas that we want to touch on. I will now very briefly introduce the, uh, the five speakers that we have in the order in which I will ask them the questions, and then I'll invite them to introduce themselves as well. So the first uh, speaker we will hear from is the Honorable Mayor Mamadou Lamin Tiam, who is the Mayor of Kebemar, Senegal. Uh, and then uh, we will hear from Mr. Runar Mirz, Mirz Balto, who is a member of the Sami Parliament of Norway uh, in Northern Norway. Uh, and then we will hear uh, from uh, Mr. 
Ola Hendrickson, who is the regional regional director of the International Organization of Migration Regional Office for European Economic Area, uh, the European Union and NATO. And then we will hear from Ms. Tosca Barucco, who is the special envoy for COP26 at the Italian Ministry of Foreign Affairs and International Cooperation. And then f finally, we will hear from Mr. Heliodoro Temprano Arroyo, who is advisor on international economic relations and global governance at DG ECFIN in the European Commission or associated with the European Commission. Uh, so I will now invite each of these uh, uh, panelists to give a little bit more uh, uh, of a description of what your own interests are and the work that you do. Uh, I've given your affiliation, so a little bit, maybe a minute or two on uh, your own work and your interests. Uh, let me start with Mamadou. Mamadou, please, you have the floor. You have to unmute. I'm very, yeah. I'm very happy. Go ahead. To, yes, go ahead. I'm very happy today to join this panel uh, because it is for important for us. I'm Mamadou. I was a young parliamentarian since 1998. I'm parliamentarian in Senegal. I stopped being parliamentarian in 2006. Then I have 19 here as a parliamentarian, and I went to be an ECOWAS an echo parliamentarian. Then I have to, uh, to, 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 to work a lot during all my uh, time in the parliament on the topic of environmental. Because I have, uh, in my uh, studies, I am a biological professor. I have my uh, studies in biological and in environmental, environmental, and it is why it is a topic for me. Then, I, in my, during all the time I was in the parliament, I work on the, uh, on the network of parliament, of parliamentary network of environmental. I had it in the parliament during 10 years. I make uh, on a lot of network around Africa, around West Africa, in which I was working only on this topic of environmental. Yeah. And now in my country, in my uh, province, in my municipality, where I am mayor, it is a city in the middle of Senegal, in, in the north, near the sea. And uh, uh, because of uh, uh, climate change, we have a lot of problems of migration. A lot of our citizens are now going around the sea, around the desert, to join Europe, to join um, South America, to, to join North America for immigration. Because it is because of uh, the loss of biodiversity, the changing climate is impacting, is impacting the way of life of our population. And are looking for, okay, it is why here, this topic is very important for me, and uh, uh, I think uh, for joining all together and speak. Hello. Thank you. Uh, I Thank apologize you very much, because uh, I'm a French speaker, but I'm trying yeah, to. Uh, you're okay. doing very well. You're doing very well. Uh, thank okay. you very much, Mohamed. We will come back to you and hear more about your experiences a little later. Let us uh, do the rounds of self-introductions first. Uh, so I will now invite Mr. Runar Mids Balta, who is the uh, Member of Parliament, the uh, Sami Parliament in Norway. We go from Africa to the north of Europe. Uh, 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 Runar, please go ahead. You have the floor. Kate, we are both uh, Thank you, Salim. And first, I'd like to thank you very much for the opportunity to represent the indigenous Sami people in this uh, talk. We are uh, mainland Europe's uh, one indigenous people, and our homeland, Sapmi, is uh, scattered into four uh, countries, uh, uh, Russia, Finland, Sweden, and uh, Norway. Uh, so our situation is that we are scattered uh, both inside and outside of the European uh, Union. My name is uh, Runar Mirna Spartu, and I'm the representative of the Sami people residing on the Norwegian side of the border. Uh, I'm representative of the Sami parliament in Norway, 
uh, which is the representative organ for the for the people. And I'm also the leader of uh, the Norwegian Sami Association, which is the biggest Sami organization on the Norwegian side, They're working on uh, political and cultural issues. Um, I'm really happy to be here, and I hope to Thank be you. able to to share the light on how climate change, uh, migration, and uh, the loss of biodiversity, but also climate solutions, uh, all pose a serious threat to our indigenous uh, livelihoods and culture. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you very much, Runar, uh, and, and welcome again. Uh, so let me now invite our third uh, speaker to uh, give a little bit more of an introduction on his own work, Mr. Ola Henriksen, the Regional Director of IOM. Ola, you have the floor. Thank you very much, Salim, and good afternoon, everybody. It's a pleasure being on this panel, and thank you all for participating. Yes, my name is Ola Henriksen. I'm, since the beginning of last year, the Regional Director for IOM in Brussels. And before that, I worked for almost three decades for the Swedish government in the area of migration. So we covered quite quite a large part of it. And, and our particular interest today is, of course, how uh, biodiversity impacts migration. It's a con interest of IOM as a global organization, but also in the region. So I'm looking forward to the discussions today. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ola, and, and welcome again. Uh, so let me now uh, invite our fourth uh, panelist uh, speaker uh, to introduce herself, uh, Ms. Tosca Baruca uh, from Italy. Uh, Tosca, please, you have the floor. Thank you, Salim, and thanks to the speaker. Uh, I am the Italian MFA Special Envoy for COP26 to ensure that uh, the protection of biodiversity, which is one of the five priority of COP26, is high on our agenda. Our Prime Minister participated to the Bio City Summit organized by the UN and uh, rest assured that uh, the topics that uh, uh, we are discussing are very high also in uh, the Italian cooperation uh, sector. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Tosca, and we look forward to hearing a bit more about that later. later. Uh, and then the last uh, uh, introduction uh, will be from Heliodoro Temprano Arroyo uh, from ECFIN, DG ECFIN. Heliodoro, you have the floor. Unmute. You need to unmute. Yes, uh, thank you, uh, Salim. Um, uh, as, I, as you say, I, I am an advisor of the International uh, the, uh, Director General for Economic and Financial Affairs of the European Commission. I am actually an international macroeconomist. But I have uh, increasingly moved into uh, development and um, and migration issues. I, I headed uh, for a while the Globalization and Development Policy Unit of, of DG ECFIN, as well as the Neighborhood and uh, Microfinance Assistance Unit in ECFIN. I have also spent some time at the International Monetary Fund. And more recently, I devoted some time at the uh, European University Institute uh, to work on the potential use of EU aid instruments and trade policy to support our external migration and refugee policy. And uh, in that context, I did some work in particular on the use of, on the relevance of our uh, climate finance uh, to developing countries uh, for uh, displacement, for displacement and migration. And it's a pleasure for me to be here with all of you today. Thank you very much, Eliodoros, and we hope we hope to hear a bit more how we might take this issue forward in future uh, in terms of uh, uh, preventing a displacement by looking after the environment and biodiversity, an issue that uh, we probably don't do enough about or don't know enough about. So I will now um, start the, uh, the questions for our speakers and uh, ask them to uh, give us some share some thoughts and, and uh, uh, views from their own experiences. Uh, I would request that you don't give very long presentations so that we can have time to uh, have a back and forth uh, a Q&A uh, answer and, and uh, discussion rather than long presentations. Uh, but feel free to you know uh, uh, make sure that you have, are able to say what you want to say. So the first question is for our uh, Honorable Mayor Mamadou from uh, Senegal. Uh, and you already alluded to this. What I would like you to do is to share your experience from your region of Senegal or the country of Senegal, where you see you already talked about displacement and mobility and people leaving. What is the relationship with environmental degradation and particularly 
more importantly with the biodiversity uh, loss in, in your country and in your particular region, in your municipality and around your municipality. Uh, Mamadou, please share some of your experiences. You have to unmute. You're muted. Mamadou, you have to unmute. You, you're muted. Um, yeah. Okay. Okay. Now. Is it okay. Okay. I say that. Yes, in okay. My, Go ahead. Okay. In my municipality, the loss of biodiversity is characterized in decrease of certain plants and animal species. And here, you see the old days, we, we used to see a lot of animals here, plants uh, that being impossible to see today. And then it, is, um, uh, it has similarly affected the proper functioning of our ecosystem by making it more vulnerable. And then uh, we have now a long dry season. And all the we had a, dry, uh, a rainy season who we were nine months or ten months. Now we have a long dry season and culture and uh, agriculture is not good. People have not a uh, good season for having what to eat. It is why a lot of, uh, of persons are now moving. They go in the capital or they leave the country. Now, uh, it is, uh, you, you can't see uh, a lot of vegetation here. And it is worth a fact for live wooding. And uh, many poultry farmers lose their boils to heat in addition. Some forest plants that tend to grow in rent. There is also the distillation of fishing resource and sighing so of a loss of recipes. Here, we, we use it to go to the sea, and now it is a problem. Everywhere people use to see, to find food in the nature is now impossible. And because of uh, degradation of the nature, because of climate change and the loss of biodiversity, and uh, there is a moving of person. They can't stay in here. It is why the municipality have a topic to to do how to retain people here. We have a lot of people now who are in Europe, who are in uh, everywhere in the world in migration, and then we have uh, making a lot of policy how to retain them here, or how to make those who are now in Europe to come back with their European experience to make a project here for developing agriculture or other things. It is uh, our first problem. We are making a plantation of trees to, to modify our environmental. And it is a big pro project here in the house. Around our city, around the, the uh, around our city, we are making a lot of plantation for uh, remove of the nature. And it is very difficult because if you have new plantation, there is no rain, or you can't have water to make it growing, it is a problem. Because we have now to, to think about putting some uh, uh, factories. We are making a new factories here. Factories work uh, for service. We are thinking about everything, but uh, uh, it is the way on which we are uh, asking the, uh, the government to make an effort for helping the municipality to retain people in city. But we can't do it without the help of the, uh, the, the, the government. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much. That's very, very interesting. In fact, I had the good fortune of visiting Senegal a few years ago, and I had a very, very nice uh, time there and a very nice memory of uh, uh, the people in, in Senegal. So nice to hear about your experience. Uh, we will come back to you uh, in a little while to do some follow-up on that. But let me now move on uh, to uh, Runar and ask him to maybe share a little bit of the experience from the other side of the world, northern 
part of Europe in uh, the Sami lands where you are also seeing, uh, I believe, quite a lot of impacts of uh, on biodiversity and affecting uh, people's livelihoods and uh, displacement as well. Runar, please, you have the floor. Thank you, Salim. So the Sami culture and livelihood is uh, nature-based. Uh, we fish, we hunt, we harvest from the nature, and a lot of us are reindeer herders, uh, following the reindeer herds on their instinctive migration for uh, for pastures. This is our livelihoods and, uh, and our culture. Now, as a nature-based culture, we are very vulnerable to, to climate change and, uh, and also the loss of uh, biodiversity. For instance, uh, Changing snow conditions is a problem for uh, reindeer herding. We are often seeing uh, unstable uh, weather during the winters, uh, now more than we used to before. We get uh, snow and then we get rain, and then snow and rain again, which uh, creates ice, uh, making the pasture underneath the snow inaccessible for uh, for the reindeer. Uh, we call it locked uh, pastures. Um, this is one of many examples, and it is... Uh, yeah, and I think it's fair to say that it's beyond doubt that our livelihood and, and, and our culture is directly and negatively affected by climate change itself. Uh, but if I may, uh, Salim, I'd like to draw your attention to how uh, also ex expanding cities, the building of infrastructure, and uh, climate solutions are creating a new set of problems uh, for us, uh, causing biodiversity loss on a massive scale in the, in the Arctic. For instance, large mining projects uh, to extract minerals that are said to be needed to for the electrification of cars, for instance, and uh, not, at, not least the expansion of wind power, uh, which has exploded in, in, in our Arctic areas uh, and in all, the, in all the Nordic countries. The impacts of these so-called green solutions are massive on, on, on nature and biodiversity, and for the Sami people, it totally destroys important areas for our traditional uh, livelihood. Thank you very much, Runar, and thanks for reminding, you know, that uh, everything that we think of a solution comes with its own problems. So, you know, green green power we think of as a good thing, but for the Sami people it may not be such a good thing. So we need to be aware of that as we go forward. Thank you very much. So let me now turn to Ola. Uh, you've heard two very good examples of underlying uh, environmental and biodiversity loss factors uh, that are driving people to migrate. And I know the IOM uh, has to come in when the crisis occurs and the migration happens. Uh, I'm very familiar with IOM. I've worked with them in Bangladesh where they are working with the Rohingya uh, uh, refugees in Bangladesh. Uh, and you have to pick up the pieces when the crisis occurs. But to what extent are we able to think about this early on and prevent migration as opposed to deal with migration when it becomes a crisis. Ola, your thoughts, please. Thank you very much. Uh, Listen with great interest to Mamadou and Runar explaining the challenges in, in their regions and, and particularly in Runar's case. I'm, I'm familiar from my own case, visiting those areas quite frequently and seeing the, the difference in, in the snow and rain over time. Uh, a few remarks from, from the IOM side. Yes, it's, it's, it's true that we sometimes get involved in, when there's the crisis ongoing and, and there's a need for humanitarian assistance. I think there is, however, a need to be a bit more proactive and to have a whole of government and whole of society approach to this. And I think over the last decades, we've seen an increased interest for global governance looking into all the facets of migration and, of course, the, the global compact on migration adopted in 2018. This is a clear uh, case in, in mind. And, and also, I think, in the EU sense, we now see with, with the relatively new commission, they have put out their priorities. We, ha we had the presentation on the EU Pact on Mas Asylum and Migration four weeks ago. <clears throat> we have the priorities for the Green Deal. So I think there is a case for a whole of government approach. And I think there are some areas that, that probably need to be looked into if we're going to be able to be more proactive. And of course, data is, is one of them to collect the data, but also to do the analysis of the data. What is the link between biodiversity and migration? We have some, some clear examples from the previous presenters, but I think more, more can be done into that. 
but also looking into what degree migration can also be an answer to this. How can uh, migration actually be, be the, the be an agent for development, and how can we how can the migrants also uh, mitigate some of the problems, and how can the different actors in this, be it governments or international organizations, regional and, and national governments, uh, facilitate uh, the migration that is needed, but also uh, take, take the advantages of it. So I think that there is a lot of things to do. I think there are some frameworks that can be looked into, uh, but we need more data. We need, we need more analysis for that. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ola, for that. <clears throat> I think... Uh, good advice for us to be proactive and plan ahead as much as possible and anticipate uh, problems before they become a crisis, uh, while we can still deal with them as a problem and not have to deal with them as a crisis. Uh, let me now move on to Tosca uh, from Italy. Tosca, we are all looking forward to the Italian and the British uh, joint uh, uh, chairing of COP26 next uh, year of the UN Framework Convention. Uh, these are very much issues under the Framework Convention, both uh, linking to biodiversity, also with migrant migration under the issue of loss and damage. Uh, these are uh, both politically sensitive on the one hand, but also important for us to recognize and, and think about on the other hand. And, and we would be very interested to hear what, what you think about it and perhaps a little bit about what the Italian government is thinking about these issues going forward. Um, well, uh, thanks to Salim uh, for uh, uh, introducing uh, the panel with the very stimulating question. Uh, we started this endeavor with the, with the UK of being co-presidents of COP26 in, uh, let's say, in a different uh, international uh, setting. Um, now, after the pandemic, uh, we still uh, uh, need uh, to uh, strive uh, f to fight the climate change. And uh, what is uh, important is that uh, uh, we have an opportunity uh, now and a moral duty to build back better. And that uh, is possible if uh, the Paris Agreement, the 2030 Agenda, and European Green Deal uh, will uh, be aligned in this uh, post-pandemic recovery. And uh, uh, so uh, tackling climate change and getting uh, uh, all governments to push for more ambitious uh, solutions not just in mitigation, but also in raising investment in clean technology, uh, directing from polluting industries which affect uh, um, biodiversity, and uh, engaging in climate for finance will be crucial aspects of our co-presidency. Let me finish saying that uh, we will have with the UK uh, a magic uh, star alignment because we will hold the presidency of the G20, the UK will have the presidency of the G7, we'll co-host COP26 in partnership in 2021. So we see this as a unique opportunity to take advantage of the synergy and uh, in to see that the different multilateral, multilateral fora uh, can uh, tackle climate change uh, and its social, economic, political implications, including the, the protection of biodiversity and also the issue of migration. So that is more or less what we see, an holistic framework in the COP26. We have the priorities and the biodiversity and nature-based solution, which I can go deeper later, will be a strong mm -hmm. part of our, priority, of our, of our presidency. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much, Tosca. That's very, very interesting, and I'll try and come back to you on that uh, a little later. But let us hear now from Heliodoro. Uh, uh, Heliodoro, you have uh, a long experience of advising the European Union, particularly on uh, uh, their uh, aid policy for developing countries, particularly in Africa. From your experience and analysis, how do you see uh, this issue of preemptive investment to prevent the problem 
and the crisis of migration uh, taking place in, in the countries in Africa. For example, we heard the example of Senegal, for example, from uh, Mamadou. Are there opportunities in the European Union's budgeting and, and financial uh, uh, planning uh, for these issues to be taken up at a early stage rather than at a late stage? Hilutoro, you have the floor. Yes, thank you, Salim, for, for the question. In fact, I mean, it's clear that uh, climate change and the loss of biodiversity is, is becoming increasingly, it's increasingly contributing to forced displacement and also economic migration. And uh, even though sometimes the, all the talk about an explosion in, in environmental refugees is, of course, uh, exaggerated. But uh, this means that, of course, uh, the use of our aid, external aid, aid instruments is, is, is to try to mitigate environmental change is, is high relevance. And, uh, of course, uh, slow onset environmental events such as biodiversity tend to be more relevant for economic migration, whereas uh, rapid onset events such as natural catastrophes created by climate change are more relevant, relatively more relevant for, for displacement. Mm -hmm. But both are relevant for do both types of migration. And uh, the thing is that the European Union and other donors, the National Committee, has been making over the last uh, years a lot of effort to channel an increasing share of their aid resources towards climate change. And even though the main objective of this was not uh, migration policy or to address the cost of migration, as often said, but in fact, it had this uh, benefit in the sense that, uh, uh, that it, uh, we can discuss about how it was done. For example, what I pretty much are in my research is that we devoted too much effort to mitigation, uh, financial on climate change mitigation, and not sufficiently uh, on or adaptation, which is, I know you're an expert on um, adaptation, <laughs> that is much more relevant, much more relevant from the point of view of displacement and migration. But we can come back to that as one of, would be one of my recommendations for you. But what is important is that much as we have done a lot of effort, the, the EU, particularly, a lot of, a lot of effort, the EU is not only the, the, the world's major donor of AIDA, but also is the main contributor of ODA for climate change. So if we are responsible, the EU and its member states, for about 60% of total finance for climate change that is given for developing countries. And this share it has been increasing. So this is very important. We should have some satisfaction, but it's not enough of what we're doing. But the problem I'm related to this conference is that we're doing much less in terms of bio, bio, biodiversity. Unfortunately, biodiversity is a bit of uh, suffering from this uh, political focus and attention on climate change as if it was the only environmental problem. We're not doing enough on climate change, but certainly that also diverting some attention from biodiversity. The, the new uh, the biodiversity strategy for 2030 tries to correct this. It's very, very important. It's great that the European Green did not just uh, focus on climate change, but it has managed to address this. But the problem is that we have to put our money where our work are. <laughs> and here is where we have, yes, we have not such an ambitious, such a commensurate effort plan so far. We might, hopefully, we will develop it. And it's only us, the international community, on biodiversity. Let me put you some examples. In our new macro financial perspective, multi annual financial perspective, our eight, eight year, seven year long term budget for the EU that we are discussing. We are planning to increase, actually the Commission has proposed that 25% of all our spending should be climate relevant. That's very good. That's up from 20% in the previous MFF. But actually, the European Council in July, in the context of announcing also the uh, new uh, uh, European uh, new generation instrument for in response to the um, uh, COVID crisis, which is at, at the score has the, the the, the, the recovery and resilience facility, uh, we've announced a target even more ambitious for when you, co when you count the, 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 the spending of the MFA plus this new instrument, which amounts to 750 billion uh, uh, euros, which will be mostly obtained by borrowing the capital markets, the target for climate change will be 30%. But there's no target for the specific target for biodiversity. Mm -hmm. Take, for example, our the so-called Indici instrument, which is our main, it's going to be our main instrument for development. We're going to amalgamate in this instrument most of our instruments. 
and it has, in the proposal of the Commission, Corrales hasn't been rejected by the Council, a target, a so-called horizontal expenditure, a spending target of 25% for climate change related, but it has not one for biodiversity. Or take, for example, the European uh, uh, Investment Bank, which has, is going to become the most important public bank for climate change. It has targeted 35% of its lending operations outside, or under the so-called external lending mandate, are for climate change, but there is no one on biodiversity. So we can do much more, uh, but of course we have to be also aware of the fact that, that, uh, uh, that I mean, uh, the two uh, things are mutually uh, complementing each other. Climate change That's right. is good. Mm -hmm. to, 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 so we have to be careful about the proliferation of tariffs. The European Parliament has been proposing the introduction of a, a, a biodiversity uh, mainstreaming target of 10% in, in the context of the new okay. MFA. But we have to start with how this is done. We have to find this target jointly because otherwise we will lead to a proliferation of our targets. And since there is interaction between two, we can think, for example, of having a sub target with an overall target sure. for climate. Effect. I mean, we know that 80% of biodiversity expenditure counts as climate spending under the real market. So we have to be taking this into account. Right. But or we can design joint targets for both of us, but we have to think what we're going to do and we have to lead by example also in the international setting in the context of next Thank year's COP to see how we can push Thank the international you. community to devote more resources towards biodiversity. But then we can talk about this Thank later. You. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Eladora. That was very, very good. And in fact, you know, what you said was very close to my heart that the climate change uh, investments are going not enough to adaptation and, and uh, uh, skewed in favor of mitigation. Not that we don't need mitigation, but we also need to take adaptation into account and even more uh, biodiversity linkages as well. And and there are win-wins to be had in, in taking this uh, multi uh, uh, a sectoral approach going forward. Uh, let me uh, go back to Mamadou now and ask you, Mamadou, what would be your advice to our friends in Europe uh, from your perspective in uh, in Senegal? Uh, what kind of investments do you feel would be helpful to both uh, help the preservation of biodiversity, conservation of uh, biodiversity, and at the same time enable jobs, employment, people to stay, not migrate, or even come back from Europe uh, to Senegal and invest and take uh, activities and do things there. What, can you mention one or two things that you might uh, offer as advice uh, to our friends from Europe uh, who are listening in on this call? Mamadou, please. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Salim. Salim. I, uh, I hear with a lot of interest Mrs. Toscana and Mr. Eliodoro, who speak about uh, the new politic, uh, European politics about uh, uh, biological uh, change and uh, um, change, uh, climatic change and migration. I went in Copenhagen. I see all about we discuss. In the agreement of Paris, put a lot of of hopes about uh, green green farms, but now what I hope is to to make European to make the green farms to use the green farms for stopping migration in Africa. It is there is a lot of farm we are we, we agree to follow in Africa, but we have to to use it for maintaining young people in Africa. With the, with the green farm, we can put a lot of new um, work, green, farm, green works in Africa. And uh, using this, uh, this opportunity of found greens, we can try to maintain a lot of young Africa in Africa. Other thing, there's a lot of migration of uh, Africa or Senegalese people who are now in Europe, they have a new experience about a lot of factories, everything. They can return in Africa with a project, but they don't have money to do. It is the way to make them coming back in Africa with green funds to stay in Africa and to improve their country. We have a lot of lands. We have some rivers. We have a uh, uh, water in the, our ground. 
but we have just found to get out uh, to make uh, uh, offshore uh, uh, to to put uh, how to take uh, the for the free how to to uh, to 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 have a lot of forage here for the free but it is uh, our our problem a lot of young people can want to make a farmer Mm -hmm. Want to do agriculture farm with that because it, uh, it is why I, uh, farm, our European people during the corps of Italian corps in 26, we think we must put a big topic about climate change and immigration because right. now it is a real fact in the Africa. Uh, economic migration is. Uh, is done because of climate change. People don't found on their country how to, uh, how why to stay, and because they can't uh, found own food or works to do to do something. Because why? I uh, I hope that in the next COP in Italy we have a big focus on climate change and immigration. How to use the green farms to. Uh, to, to, to improve uh, mitigation and adaptation uh, against climate change in Africa. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mamadou. Some very, very good sound advice that we can take forward, and I'll, I'll ask Tosca to respond to that in a few minutes. But let me now move to uh, Runar again and, and ask you uh, okay. a question. <laughs> Runar, one, one, I, I have a specific uh, interest. You know, you represent... Uh, the Sami indigenous communities of uh, the northern part of Europe uh, and indigenous people have a very, very important uh, role for centuries and millennia in terms of preservation and of, of nature and living of nature. Um, and how do you, uh, what is your experience as a representative of uh, the indigenous people of uh, northern Europe? when you have to deal with, you know, central governments of Norway and the other countries where the Sami people are, are a minority indig indigenous people, do you get uh, heard? Is your voice listened to? To what extent uh, are you able to uh, bring in your, your deep knowledge and experience of working with nature that many other people don't have, particularly those of us who live in cities? We've lost all of that culture, which you now have. Uh, I'm very intrigued to hear what your take on that is, Runar. Please. So we are uh, definitely trying uh, our best to to have our voice heard on a number of uh, of levels, from uh, from local government to national government, but also at the at the European level and uh, and, and and at the EU and uh, international level. Uh, and, and I can say that as an indigenous representative institution um, within the Norwegian democratic system, we we, we do have a lot of. Uh, uh, mechanisms to consult uh, with the government on issues uh, uh, on all issues relating to uh, to the Sami people and the Sami culture, but also uh, uh, specifically relating to land use uh, on a regular basis. Uh, whether we are heard or not, that's a different uh, question. But we're definitely in, uh, in, in 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 consultations. We also have mechanisms to raise uh, objections to changing land use on a municipal and local level. Uh, now, on the European level, we are trying our best to influence the EU so that um, uh, biodiversity is being prioritized uh, now when uh, the European Green Deal is being uh, rolled out, as was uh, uh, mentioned here uh, earlier. Uh, our culture is uh, dependent on it, and uh, the Sami uh, use of nature is also, in, in our view, it's also a part of maintaining the the biodiversity in the in the Arctic as it is a sustainable use of the of nature. Um, uh, so for us, it is uh, important that the climate solutions are not being used as moral argument to ex extinguish indigenous cultures, as I uh, as I mentioned earlier. Yeah. Another another point that I wanted to make is that um, what I'm hearing from uh, Sami colleagues is that uh, uh, there is concern related to the fact that. Uh, 
the EU states in, in which our people reside, uh, namely Sweden and Finland, they are often able to negotiate exceptions from uh, EU regulations. Uh, for instance, on, on forestry and, um, and, and forest conservation and uh, also on issues relating to minerals. Uh, for us, it is important that uh, such a practice of uh, exceptions uh, does not... Uh, Yes, that it will not be able to limit the reach of bio, the biodiversity strategy uh, because it is so important for us uh, for us uh, to be heard there. Now, if I also may mention the international stage, so uh, so so we are the uh, Tamil people. Um, uh, we are uh, we are yeah, also uh, we are also part of uh, of of uh, no, we go and, and try to influence uh, the uh, the um, climate negotiations, for example, under uh, UN, UNFCCC. Uh, so we have been able to, together with uh, a lot of our indigenous uh, friends uh, and indigenous peoples globally, been able to uh, create a, a, a yeah, indigenous platform at the climate mm -hmm. negotiations. It's right. called the, the Local Communities and Indigenous Peoples Platform, and it was a con constituted body established at COP24 in, in Katowice. Mm -hmm. Um, so I, I just wanted to make one uh, one appeal to uh, to Miss Barocco, I guess, uh, who, who is working on the COP uh, uh, preparations now. That uh, mm -hmm. this platform, uh, I hear that definitely needs funding to be able to uh, <laughs> to, to, to work out well. So that is uh, one one Good. aspect that is important uh, to remember in order to ensure indigenous uh, that indigenous voices are being heard at this level too. Thank, Thank you. you. Excellent. We will we will ask uh, Tosca to to uh, take that into consideration when we come to her again. Uh, but let me just go to Ola now and uh, ask you a question. You know, uh, my understanding of the IOM is that you are you know uh, have your heads up to your heads in humanitarian crisis management. Now, within the organization of IOM, to what extent do you think you can? Talk about these kinds of long-term issues, biodiversity and environment, and you know, talking about uh, preventing uh, future uh, migration, where you have your hands more than full dealing with the immediate crisis that you have on your hands right now. Is there is there any bandwidth for these longer-term uh, uh, considerations within an institution uh, that is, you know, crisis managing like yours? Yes, thank, thank you for the question. Yes, we are crisis management, but not only. I, I think we have other capacities and, and competences as well. And, and there's a team in the Brussels office and in headquarters and around in, in different IOM offices following uh, the, the, the issue of biodiversity and how migration, ch ch climate change is, is, is influencing migratory floods. So, so we we, of course, follow this closely even now, and I would also say that, again, this is a bit of an institutional issue. We are, as you know, since 2016, a UN-related agency. I mentioned in my previous intervention the Global Compact on Migration, where, uh, which includes the adverse impacts of climate change and environmental degradations in Objectives 2 and 5. We work together with other UN uh, organizations. The Secretary General already in, I think it was in March 2018, put up something called the UN Migration Network, where we coordinate with other UN organizations, basically all interested partners, but there is also a core of eight UN organizations, uh, us, UNHCR, OHCHR, UNDP, OCHA, uh, UNICEF and others. So, so there is a core of organizations and, and we are now together with them trying to put up a fund of, uh, we have clustered the, or the, the UN Migration Network has clustered the, 20, the, the 23 objectives of the Global Compact into five clusters, trying to raise funding for this. So, so there is, I think, on, on the overall Global governance side, there, there has been a lot of achievements over the last 20 years since, since Kofi Annan started addressing the, the, the lack of UN comprehensive policies in the area of migration and, and us being part of the UN system is a case in there. So working together with other UN organizations, also working, of course, together with national and regional government, but also regional organizations, EU, of course, being very important and very elaborate one. 
but also the African Union and regional organizations. So I think this is a bit, we, we have our competences, but we also need to pool our competences with others. And there was a mentioning of the UNFCCC task force for displacement, and we are a member of this group. Uh, migration issues are also part of the UN Convention to co- Combat Desertification. So I think the UN is picking up the migration parts in, in its, uh, there needs to be a complementarity between different strands of the UN work and, and other organizations' work. So yes, we're trying as much as we can to, to, to be part of uh, the solution and come up with the good uh, examples in, in all of this. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ola. Uh, let me now um, uh, turn to Tosca. Tosca, you already have a couple of questions, one from uh, uh, Runar on the indigenous uh, opportunity for the indigenous people to participate in COP26, and you also mentioned the issue of nature-based solutions. I would like to add another element for uh, you to share some thoughts on. Uh, as I understand it, Italy will be hosting a pre-COP uh, meeting in Milan that will focus on youth in particular. And I think that, you know, we haven't mentioned youth in this conversation so far, but in my view, there are very, very important uh, uh, cohort of people that we need to think about. And, you know, they are the future migrants or non-migrants. Uh, whatever happens is going to happen to the young people uh, in, our, in all our countries. So if you could try and uh, address uh, uh, the questions uh, that, that you've heard, and, and please feel free to share your thoughts. Okay, first of all, I wish to thank Ola because he gives me the opportunity to uh, give a hint on policy coherence. On what, uh, and uh, with that, uh, it's uh, it's a big uh, it's a big uh, uh, question on how to integrate all the different uh, aspects of the fight of climate change, uh, the debate, adaptations versus mitigation is an example of the fact that everything is complementary and that when you fight the desertification, you fight the, for biodiversity, you fight the effect of climate change, you help prevent uh, uh, un- unwanted migration. So you, you have a policy framework that will need to be addressed at COP26. <laughs> Uh, both a governance problem, a resource problem, and how we are managing to put uh, all these interlinked questions in a picture that drives to action. Uh, well, uh, talking at an FCCC and drive to action is, uh, as, you, as you know already, an enormous task, but rest assured that the Italian co-presidency has very, very clear the fact that all these issues are interlinked, that the debate on adaptation and uh, uh, biodiversity is uh, uh, extremely um, promising because of protecting biodiversity, we are in fact uh, preventing a lot of uh, uh, protecting biodiversity. We are doing adaptation and uh, preventing all the root causes of uh, what uh, we, uh, we are facing now. On the youth, well, the youth is the focus of the Italian co-presidency. We will host the pre-COP, which is a negotiating event at the uh, state uh, and official uh, level. But we will also host back-to-back the youth COP. The youth COP, together with the United Nations uh, Office for the Youth, will give uh, uh, Worldwide, the youth, all countries we hope to be represented, uh, an opportunity to interact with the official delegations. So the consultations with the youth will be flowing into the negotiating rooms, which I think is extremely, extremely interesting because this is the first time we also are working on the, what happened with the youth uh, uh, event of 2019 uh, at the UN, uh, where we took his inspiration from uh, to have this uh, youth COP. So the, our focus on youth is uh, uh, very, very important to broaden the perspective. And uh, we will involve a civil society, the business, the academy, local authorities. Uh, what uh, we 
need for this is to have uh, the, the widest possible multi-stakeholder approach. So I hope that with this event we will also be able to address a wide spectrum of stakeholders. And uh, the use, as you said, as a bigger component into, into the migration debate. So I think that the fresh views and uh, a few slaps on the face of the delegates, if I may say so, because uh, I'm ready to get uh, there too. Uh, so uh, that uh, we will be will be part of the will be part of our COP. Thanks. Good, good. I look forward to that. Hopefully, we can all uh, come to Italy for the for the COP at that time. <laughs> uh, so, uh, let me now move on to Heliodorus and ask you a question. Now, uh, given your experience and knowledge of how the European Union works, and also your description of the the enormous amounts of money that you quoted earlier, my question is: How does one do these things in a practical way? Uh, uh, you know, the allocating big amounts of money is one thing, but making them effective is really, to me, a much more uh, 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 difficult question. Uh, and and uh, you've heard all the conversations and you have a lot of experience here. Uh, I'd really love to hear from you a little bit about how does one do this and how can we influence and is it possible at all for outsiders like me sitting in Bangladesh to influence the decision making within the European Union uh, on how they're going to allocate these resources and what are they going to do about it. Uh, and at this, also let me say for the participants, if there are any questions, please feel free to put them in. I think we'll have a few minutes uh, for the speakers to answer participants' questions. Hilio Doros, you have the floor. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Salim. Uh, just, I think one uh, simple and concrete, concrete uh, recommendation is, uh, especially when it comes to adaptations related, adaptation related projects, is to, to, to talk to the locals. I think, and that's why we have a network of delegations that manage our aid. We don't manage our aid from Brussels. We agree on the big numbers in Brussels, but it's up to them to really see what's happening and think of projects that can meet several objectives. Uh, that can be uh, good uh, from an environmental point of view, but can give jobs as well, that can help adapt, whether it's to biodiversity-related change or to climate change. So a lot of it has to do with, with trying to uh, find in, uh, in the field those projects. And actually, for example, if you look at the, our future main instrument for international cooperation, we have, as I said, a target of 25% for climate change-related projects, but we have another target of 10% for projects aimed at addressing uh, the root causes of migration. So of all the, this envelope of, uh, we uh, forgot the figure, but uh, quite a few billion, uh, uh, I think it's about, uh, has been reduced in the, by the Council in the recent negotiations, but it's uh, still about 80 billion uh, euros over, over seven years to make, to, to have, to try to come up with projects which can uh, be relevant for, for both or for the three objectives. We can have projects which are good for, for biodiversity adaptation, uh, but can also be uh, good for, from a migration point of view, of, of things that can be good for biodiversity and climate change. So that's one thing. But I think in terms of the targets, uh, you know, the discussion in Brussels, in terms of what, I think there is all this discussion that has also, the, the parliament is pushing about, for example, this target of 10% for biodiversity. But I think it's important to think of whether this is a good idea or we will, we might want to do something, but perhaps not necessarily to have a separate target of 10% for biodiversity, but to consider, for example, a sub-target within the overall target we have for climate change, or to have a climate a target that is encompassing both of them, expenditure for either climate change-related projects or biodiversity. But beyond the, the, the whole debate about targets, which in the end I believe is not so crucial, what is important is the total amount of funds that we are going to devote. And also the use of other instruments. Uh, if you see the, uh, the communication on the, on the Green Deal or the biodiversity communication, we talk about other instruments. We have, for example, trade policy. We are now going to require for any new free trade agreement that countries respect and implement uh, the, uh, the Paris Club or a number of international conventions environment. We are now considering to, we are reviewing the 
the, the regulation on the generalized system of preferences, our main policy to grant preference to developing countries. I'm actually part of the working group in the Commission that works on that. Well, there's a whole debate about, we have, for example, the GSP Plus is linked to the respect of uh, 17 international conventions that countries must uh, ratify and implement in order to benefit from these trade preferences. Well, we are, we realize that we have not sufficient uh, representation of international environmental protections and commitments, so we're going to bring this in most likely. So we have, we can use other instruments, or whether it's, for example, our new taxonomy of sustainable activities for the finances, for the capital market, our green budget techniques that we are pioneers in this, uh, the use of green taxation. We can, in our, through our political dialogue or through other instruments, also try to encourage our developing partners to introduce regulatory frameworks and policies that are conducive to fighting biodiversity loss or climate change. So these are concrete things that I think we could do. We, we, we could do more about that. But most importantly, we must also lead, as we have been doing in climate change, by example, as I said, and I think it's crucial. We have a very important step with this new biodiversity strategy. Now we must uh, translate it into a, 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 an ambitious, uh, a leading position uh, at, at the at next year's uh, COP, and uh, both in terms of targets, and yeah, we have very ambitious targets in our biodiversity com communication for 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 restoration, for protection of land and seas. That's very good. But also, we need to have commitments in the financial area ourselves, and also encourage them to the our, our partners. When we lead, we are much more likely to be influential. So this is our big challenge: is how we from now. To this uh, COP, we do sufficient uh, uh, steps in implementing this uh, strategy put forward by the communication so that by the time this conference comes, we have already uh, demonstrated or we will still have to do a lot of things in, in detail that we are leading by example. Very good. Very good. Our, our macro approach, our international political macro approach that is led by Brussels, but also about the everyday uh, uh, design and, and identification of projects by our network of delegations, taking into account sure. the fact that migration and environmental change are so connected. Absolutely. Very, very good. Thank you very much. Those are extremely practical uh, uh, suggestions for taking this forward, and I hope that that will happen. Um, we, we are getting a few questions in from the panelists or the uh, participants, and let me uh, share one or two and, and invite uh, uh, our panelists to respond uh, uh, to them. Interesting question from Marcella Passotti, who says, climate change affects the whole world, not only developing countries, in quotes. Uh, Europe is directly affected too. How do you think migrant populations living in Europe could contribute to mitigate the challenges of climate change? Uh, how could we leverage the potential contribution of migrant populations inside Europe uh, to meet the, the objectives of the Green Deal. Um, interesting question. You know, the migrant population within Europe also has a, a potential role to play. Uh, and do, do any of you wish to uh, respond to that? Ha any thoughts on that? Especially our European friends. Anybody, please, please feel free. I, I can try starting just to okay. give it. Okay, good, good, go, you're brave, I mean, go ahead. Uh, I mean, if, if it's about, as, as the, the person proposing the question said, and as we've heard also from the panel, the climate change doesn't only affect, it, it affects globally and also in, in the northern parts of Europe. But coming back to, to the role of migrants, I think one, one clear uh, part is where migrants can leverage is in terms of remittances and not just financial remittances. We all know that the financial remittances are far bigger than the official development uh, assistance, but there are other forms of remittances also, knowledge, uh, and other things that, that migrants can contribute to the countries and regions of origin what they have uh, achieved in, in, in other countries. I think that, and, and also building possibly on circular migration schemes where this can be leveraged. So, so that would be one example that I would like to put forward. Thank you. Great, thank you very much. Um, let me move on to another question. This comes from uh, Sum, 
it says the MFF allocates specific funding for climate change. Often migration is not necessarily being considered by the national actors involved in climate finance. How can we sensitize the actors to consider migration-related outputs? Uh, a good question. Uh, I, I think it's a valid point that when the climate uh, uh, programs are, are designed, these Green New Deals are designed, migration doesn't seem to play a role, or the connection to migration uh, does not seem to be self-evident. How does one uh, convince them that, that uh, the issue of migration also needs to be taken into account there? Any thoughts? Iliodoros, you, you probably have the best experience in, in advising European Union on this. Any thoughts on this? Yeah, well, um, it's, a, it's a matter, it's true, it's true that we, again, we have this focus on climate change and the connection to migration is not very articulated. Although, as I said, in the com communication, on the, on the international section of this communication, there is an explicit mention to the link between climate change policy and uh, for displacement and uh, and the migration, so, but I think uh, it's a matter of of, of finding uh, as we, I mean, that's why it's useful to have other targets for migration and other horizontal spending targets. But the, the, the challenge is how we can combine them. Not uh, there's no point in having climate change, biodiversity targets, and then migration targets without realizing how connected they can be. So I think it's a little bit about educating the people who are identifying the projects. Uh, we can also force the process by having sometimes a, a target that tries to overlap the different objectives. But, uh, but uh, yes, we have been within the Commission talking a lot about this. I mean, I can say that we have talked about this, the, the interlinkage between the things. But uh, from there to seeing whether it's really going to be trans transformed uh, into real projects, we need a few more years to see whether it happens. But we are doing this in Brussels. And we are also inviting the agents in our delegation that manage our aid on uh, workshops, uh, trainings that talk about these things. But yes, it's an issue of culture and of, 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 of actual implementation. I, I'm not sure there are magic solutions, uh, but I think we are, what I can say is that the, the Commission is increasingly aware of this and trying to find ways to address those issues. It's the first time we have these combined targets, uh, well, the target for migration, on addressing the root cause of migration, the first time mm -hmm. we have a social health proposal, mm -hmm. uh, we have it for climate change, we, we, we are really moving in this direction, but we will see. Uh, Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I think we are coming to the end of our time allocation. We just have a few minutes left. Uh, I uh, want to give each of you the floor for just one minute to give us a little concluding thought in terms of what do you think needs to be done next. Uh, uh, just a quick uh, uh, one minute uh, next step uh, recommendation, if you like, from each of you. Uh, starting again for, with Mamadou. Mamadou, a one minute uh, takeaway message. Uh, thank you. Uh, I hear with a lot of interest uh, the question we are uh, now uh, discussing. But I hope that we must focus now to how to how to uh, have a lot of fund for improving, for promoting green jobs in the era we have uh, we have problem of biodiversity loss. With the green jobs, we can have some ur urban project who can uh, help to return and uh, make mitigation in a lot of countries. Then, in the Thank European you. Union or everywhere, we must have to, we must orient, we must, uh, uh, we must uh, orient, orient the green farms on the green jobs. And during the next step in the uh, Europe, in the COPs of uh, Italian, the problem, the topic of migration and uh, uh, biodiversity loss must be a big topic on which we, the link must be done and we must focus on it during the next Thank step you. of discussion of international discussion. I think all Thank of you. us. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mamadou. Uh, uh, let me now move to Runar. 
Uh, hopefully, uh, Tosca will invite you to Milan for the COP uh, in, in Italy. Uh, but what next? What do you want to see happen next? I would like to uh, to see, uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, that uh, the European Union, for instance, uh, make sure to, uh, to 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 not forget the biodiversity uh, aspect when they roll out the Green New Deal. It can't be too much uh, climate change, but we actually need to 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 uh, um, preserve uh, nature. Also, because uh, a lot of cultures and peoples are lives are dependent on nature. For instance, uh, the ones of indigenous uh, peoples. So, thank you very much for a very interesting uh, discussion. Thank you, Runa. Thank you for your contributions. Ola, last words from your side. Thank you. I, I want to come back to a few points I've already raised. I think the the need to collect and, and disseminate and analyze data is, is extremely important to see the links and also to, to listen to the migrants themselves to understand why they migrate. Uh, I think also to have a comprehensive approach on governance, regardless of what level, because this is not something that you can only address at the global or local level. You need to have the, the different levels working in synergy and, and avoid silos. And I think there are some clear possibilities now with the COP and, and to see how also the EU, since we are in an EU perspective, the EU and the UN can work together on this. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ola. Tosca, some final thoughts from your side? Uh, okay, let me share uh, something from the experience of the field, because uh, we've been talking about projects, uh, so let me share uh, what uh, can be done in practice uh, to, to see how the link uh, with the fight for, uh, to keep a biodiversity can be linked to the job creation locally. Uh, for instance, when uh, you uh, try to increment agriculture productivity uh, in the um, vulnerable countries, you are stabilizing the population, you are getting them a better skills, you are doing adaptation, you are presenting biodiversity uh, and creating a market for small producers. When you fight uh, with, the, for instance, FAO, UN Women, uh, uh, drought, uh, and the climate change uh, towards a sustainable agriculture, you are creating investment for uh, uh, women and the youth. So I think that the voices from the field could be the biggest contribution we need uh, for having a, a successful uh, COP. Uh, listening uh, the constituency that are affected by uh, climate change and not only the government, if I can give uh, this uh, uh, suggestion. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much, Tosca. Uh, Heliodoro, some last uh, thoughts to share. Okay, my last thoughts would be, again, no, let's not forget about biodiversity, in particular in our uh, eighth strategy towards developing countries. And let's try to go also in the field for projects that uh, are win-win strategies, win-win projects that combine different things. And here what, what Mamadou was proposing, it's, it's a very good idea to use green funds to not only create direct jobs and promising industries and green industries, but also uh, do it in a way that can help people adapt to climate change or that can help mitigate uh, uh, climate change or biodiversity loss. So we're trying to find this uh, areas of intersection that are win-win strategies for, for all. Thank you very much. Thank you all of our speakers, participants, for an extremely interesting, uh, I felt, uh, uh, discussion. I hope all our participants who listened also felt so. Uh, I'm not going to attempt to summarize the discussion. I'm sure the, uh, the organizers will bring out a summary document later on. Uh, but I will take this opportunity to share a few of my own uh, thoughts uh, from where I sit in Dhaka, Bangladesh, uh, and uh, on the issues that I work on here. Uh, and so in my country, Bangladesh, which I'm sure everybody is aware is one of the most vulnerable to the impacts of climate change, particularly the low-lying coastal area of Bangladesh, where we are already seeing potential impacts of people having to move uh, from losing livelihoods and having to move, and ending up in Dhaka City, which is the biggest you know, city in Bangladesh, and the fastest growing mega city. So what we are looking at is whether we can get people to Dhaka we created in these other towns for 
what we call make them resilient, migrant-friendly towns and invest in those towns for economic and education and health services so that these potential migrants who will have to leave their livelihoods in the low-lying coastal area don't end up in the slums of Dhaka, but they can go to these other towns within Bangladesh. These are not sending them out of the country, but keeping them in Bangladesh, but looking at uh, assisted or facilitated migration as a strategy, a second-order strategy of adaptation, and at the same time, doing this in a nature-based solutions uh, manner that integrates it with the uh, preservation of the wetlands and the forests and the the, uh, the soils that we have. Uh, and it's something that we are coming up with ideas. We, I'm not saying we have solved it, but it is a very promising area that we feel that is something that uh, can be done. And we would be very happy to share uh, knowledge with all of our partners and friends in, in Europe uh, going forward. There's a, there's a lot of a learning to be done across borders, south-south and south-north and north-south on this issue uh, as we uh, meet this global challenge. So with that, I'm going to uh, call it a day for now, uh, hand over to our organizers if they want to have a final say uh, from their side. Is uh, Kate, Katie or uh, 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 any of the others going to take over? Hi, Salimo. Thank you very much. Can you hear me? Yes, go ahead. Yeah, no, just to say a huge thank you to you and, and to all the panelists for this really, really interesting discussion. Um, for all the participants, thanks for the questions that came in. Sorry we couldn't get to all of them, um, but you can uh, find the recording of this event. Um, we'll share that on Twitter, um, uh, at IOM at EU, um, and uh, you can also get the tweets and things from the event and, and further information on that if you, if you check out our Twitter account. So thanks once again, um, and uh, watch this space for this uh, conversation to continue. Right. Right. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.